Tell me, uh, how did you find America? So I left to Greenland. Has success changed your life? Yes. I'd like to keep Britain tidy. Are you a mod or a rocker? Um, no, I'm a mocker. No, actually, we're just good friends. Do you think these haircuts have come to stay? Well, this one has, you know. It's stuck on good and proper now. <laughs> it's frightfully nice. Uh, what would you call that uh, hairstyle you're wearing? Arthur. No, actually, we're just good friends. You're the brown, aren't they? What do you call that collar? Oh, um, a collar. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. <laughs> And welcome back to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen Lopez, joined once again by our fearless co-host, Emily Edwards. She is back. Emily, we missed you so much. I'm so happy to be back. I can't even tell you. (laughs) And this week we are doing a rollicking hard rock look at the 1964 Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night. Before we talk about that, though, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, then you should. We do additional bonus pods, including doubled features, looking at remakes, and based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime, as well as our series. But have you read the series? We also have our Dave Carter interview that I did with him that's exclusively on Patreon for the moment. It's going to be on our YouTube channel soon. We're also going to be putting up a lot of our TCM Film Festival audio over there. And we give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guess on an episode. It starts at just $1 at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. I did want to mention we are inching ever closer to 50 patrons. I have a really sweet little prize pack that I've put together that includes some books, some special TCM merch, might include a couple other little special things as I get people to donate to this If you are interested in winning it, you should consider becoming a patron. We will be giving it out to our 50th. Stay on the hunt for that over at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And don't forget that me and Emily are authors. Emily has her Viviana Valentine series. I have my book. But have you read the book? You can order them wherever you get books. And our Redbubble store has some fabulous art designed by Samantha Richardson and Terrence Hiltz featuring your favorite stars including our always popular Makoko mugs. If you are going to be at the TCM Classic Film Festival, that Makoko design is going to be the source for our buttons and stickers that I'm going to be giving out at the festival. So if you want to try before you buy, you can get one from me at the TCM Classic Film Festival, or you can just buy a Makoko mug now at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. So A Hard Day's Night, this is directed by Richard Lester, tells the story of a day in the life of the Beatles as they try to deal with their onslaught of fans, go from show to show, and eventually play this big concert. Emily, I want to start, who's your favorite Beatle? Anybody who's been listening to the show for as long as I've been on it will not be surprised to hear that I do not have one of the more conventional favorite Beatles. My favorite Beatle is Ringo Starr. I love him to death. It is perfectly personified in this movie. All the reasons why. We'll get into it. He's just adorable. I just love Ringo. Nobody thinks Ringo should be there. I think Ringo should be there. Who's your favorite Beatle, Kristen? (laughs) I am also unconventional. I am a George Harrison fan. And I know somebody's going to say why George Harrison had better music after he left the Beatles. Do not at me with your whole Paul McCartney had a whole band after the Beatles. I know Wings fans. I get you. I know. I see you. But I just don't have the connection to that. And I just feel like George was really zen as exemplified in this movie where he just is there taking it all in. A Hard Day's Night is interesting. I can't believe this movie is turning 60 years old. I really can't because it's a movie that doesn't feel like an iconic piece of ephemera, and yet it is. This is a film that has inspired so many copycats. Once imitated, never duplicated. To the point that when I saw Spice World in 1997, I did not realize how much of a debt Spice World owes to A Hard Day's Night. Now, Spice World is not A Hard Day's Night, and it goes off the rails with aliens and a bunch of other weird stuff. But in the sense of following a band, 
telling what their life is like in this heightened reality. It's the same thing. And yet what a lot of people misinterpret with A Hard Day's Night that is why you get aliens in a Spice World movie is they believe that this band, which is so outsized and so extravagant, has to have a film to suit. And yet A Hard Day's Night really isn't this big extravagant movie. It's a story about them trying to get to a concert and maybe a couple of strange things happen, but it's always grounded in some semblance of reality. It feels almost like an upstairs downstairs comedy to me. You have the upstairs presentation of the Beatles during all the little concerts and the rehearsals that they give. But then you have the downstairs aspect of who they actually are behind the scene while they're dealing with makeup girls and the costumers and their managers and things like that. So it is a behind the scenes look, but utterly falsified because you know that they were not this wholesome and this charming and this adorable and debonair behind the scenes. They were young men who had lots and lots of money and lots and lots of girls throwing themselves at them. But it is a very, very just charming, very English comedy. And it's very contained that I like very, very much. I totally understand why Spice Girls was different. Also, 1997 was the peak uh, Austin Powers years. So they had that sort of flamboyant, erratic sort of humor that was really, really popular at the time. And obviously, the Beatles are not going to do anything to tarnish their legend. <laughs> no, you're on to something because it's important to realize this movie crafted a movement every band after this tried to make their own interpretation of this movie the monkeys did it hermits hermits did it the spice girls eventually did it at the same time it really is such a self-contained film you're totally right when you say that the late 90s really did bring this wave back it's a the 30-year gap that we commonly see which is we nostalgize everything from the last 30 years and the return of the swing in 60s in 97 was a huge thing and yet to watch a hard day's night in 64 it has none of the elements of that quote-unquote swing in 60s world that austin powers would satirize in the 90s by modern standards there is absolutely no sex in this whatsoever which is actually really surprising even though you have cascades of you screaming and tearing their hair out. It is very, very, very chaste. And I understand that in 1964, it wasn't. I write books that are set in 1950. I understand mid-century social mores. I understand that the presentation of John and Paul and George and Ringo in their tight little suits dancing away and with the girls in their barely mini skirts, barely above their knees dancing with them, that was more rock and roll and audacious than we could ever imagine. But 60 years later, it is so chaste. It is like a Catholic school dance that is well chaperoned. You wonder to yourself, how did we get from there to where we are in 60 years? How did that happen? How did that even happen? When I think of the 60s, the swing in 60s, I think of stuff like go-go dancers and Big bouffant hair, which is in here, but also the fact that the rollicking elements of it. This is a movie that's in black and white. That's, I think, a huge surprise to most people is like the Beatles aren't in color. This is not London in the 1960s in color. It's a very it's a black and white film. And a lot of that was because this was considered a novelty in America. United Artists put this together purely as a way to sell the soundtrack. Because they knew that the Beatles would make a crap ton of money. The Beatles already had an American producer at the time, Capitol Records. United Artists, who owned the rights to the film, were like, we can put this movie out and beat Capitol Records to the next Beatles album by a couple of months. That's really why they did it. So this was really made on the cheap, I think shot in 17 weeks. Very quick amount of time. Yet, when we talk about movies that are made on the cheap, you can feel it. I don't really believe this movie looks cheap. If anything, it works to the Beatles' advantage in showing this kind of whirlwind, roughshod style of their life. Absolutely. It differentiates from something that was really popular in sort of the late 90s and early 2000s, which was my early youth years, where we had a lot of tour documentaries 
we had a lot of Trent Reznor behind the scenes. This is what the bus is like. And this is what it's so horrible to be away from your family. And this is why we have so many feelings because we're grunge artists and the tour documentary was such a big deal. And this is how you're going to get closer to the inner feelings of your rock gods. But this is still very polished. There are some offhanded jokes that I caught this go around that I didn't catch when I was 19 the first time I watched it. It's very precise. Only John is really making the wildly off-color jokes. That is, from what I imagine, very on character. It's so much more packaged in a way that we ever got with the more raw, bare it's so difficult to be an artist in the late 90s and early 2000s and well through the 2000s. Whereas this is very much like, we're the Beatles and it's awesome. Alan Owen, the screenwriter who was nominated for an Oscar for the script for this movie, spent a couple days with the Beatles, did not have a whole lot of time with them based on what I've read, really just played up characteristics that he thought the Beatles were. So John, he played up as kind of a smart ass. Paul is the sensible one. George is very mellow. Ringo is the oddball. That works. If anything, whether a hard day's night is true or not, most people that think of the Beatles think that they are like their characters in a hard day's night, whether you've seen something like Get Back or not. That works to their effect in many ways. It's a miracle that this movie exists because when you think of letting a band musicians lead your film these are not trained actors at all i want to make it clear i love a hard day's night it's one of my favorite rock movies next to almost famous what i love about this movie is none of the actors are characters this is supposed to be a true story for lack of a better word and yet they are really good at acting the characters that they are portraying i think of that scene where they're in the party and they're being interviewed by all the different reporters. It's a masterpiece of comedy. They're not doing any shtick. They are just answering questions. George is just being nonchalant. Ringo has that famous quote where she says, are you a mod or a rocker? And he's like, I'm a mocker. John is, I forget what the question was, and he's essentially writing tits on the pad of paper that he's got in his hand. And Paul, it's all culminated with people asking him about people he knows, and his responses were just good friends including ending with, you know, oh, what do you think about your father? And he's like, we're just good friends. I love that. That's a really small piece of comedy that doesn't require your actors to be professional actors. And yet they're really skilled at delivering comedic one-liners in this. It's so true to life as you have interviewed people in junkets and I have watched and prepared people <laughs> for junkets. It's got to be torture. And I know people don't like to hear movie stars. This thing is so terrible. It's so grating. It's awful. They're getting paid however millions of dollars in order to do this. That looks like my worst nightmare. It looks awful. And everybody's asking you the same questions over and over again. And you have to have the same answers, but you try to make it sound fresh and interesting because it's all going to go into a different newspaper. And that just looks awful. And you have to actually be really quick on your feet in order to do that. So the fact that these people, four guys, are answering the questions and they're flirting with different women or they're being boys in a way that I feel like a lot of people forgot by 64 that these are young boys who also came from Liverpool. They are from one of the worst places to be from in Northern England at the time. They all grew up in poverty, Ringo especially. And one of the parts of growing up in poverty often comes out as having a really, really good sense of humor. It's very well portrayed that in this, that even though they're in their dapper little suits, as I've mentioned before, because the suiting in this is phenomenal, they're all working class guys who are trying to have fun with this utterly absurd thing that has landed in their lap. Like you said, this is one of the best, most delightful smartest scenes in the movie. It's also worth pointing out that American audiences especially didn't know a lot about the Beatles' personal life. And this movie does not give any glimpse into that either. If anything, it's mostly fictional. John Lennon, by this point, was married. He had had a child. He was acting a boy in the film, but really was a grown man with responsibilities by this point. I don't know if Paul McCartney was in a serious relationship by this point or not, but the movie does a really good job of keeping them untouchable. It's a lot like Elvis movies in the sense that although Elvis was always playing characters, he was never really playing a character named Elvis Presley. 
but it's still that untouchable, like you're not going to know anything about who I am as a person type of thing. The only real familial connection we get in this movie is Paul McCartney's grandpa, played by Wilfred Brambell, who is hilarious. What do they call him? He's a straight mixer who's constantly stirring the pot and getting the group to snipe at each other. He's making everybody sign autographs so he can sell them outside of the show. But at that point, Paul McCartney's grandparents were dead. He didn't really know them when they died. So it's completely fabricated. And yet it works. It just works. And even to this day, I would say watching it, not knowing a ton about the Beatles still as people, they still have what little air of mystique a public figure can have. I still feel it when I watch this. Patty Boyd, one of the young girls in the film, would become George Harrison's wife after this movie. And I'm like, that's a great factoid, but I get no vibe that they were into each other when they made this movie. They're Teflon. And that works to their effect. It makes them timeless. This is the kind of PR that celebrity publicists wish they could still attain for their clients. And that's why certain people say, I don't have social media. I don't go on social media. Everybody's got a Finsta. We know they do. But they lie because they want to maintain that sort of prepackaged aura of what you love me for is, of course, who I am behind the scenes. Young girls at the time, I don't think there was a single woman in this over the age of 20, just by looking at them though they all look 45 because of the hairdos, they are ripping their hair out for, like you mentioned, a married man with a baby. And I'm sure Paul was in a, a decent relationship. And I can see why publicists want to go back to this time. You know what I mean? It's just like the spin must have been so much easier. And it's hard to put a value judgment on what is better, what is worse, what do I prefer? Because we can never go back to this. I'm a little jealous, frankly, that they get to package themselves. Like you can always say, when you're playing a role, it's not you. If they're playing the role of being John Paul, George, and Ringo, they get to have a side that's just them. Whereas like modern musicians don't really get to do that. It's artfully done in a way that we know now a lot about these people. We know probably too much about John Lennon as a person. And if you watch Get Back, you see a real insider view of them. And yet it never diminishes my enjoyment of watching this film. And I don't 100% know why. Maybe because I'm not a deep, deep Beatles fan. Like I love the music, but I don't have this deep personal connection to them as people. Knowing what I know about John Lennon, I still watch this movie and I'm just like, he's so funny. It works. Even though John Lennon historically probably was not a barrel of laughs. Probably not a bucket of fun. I mainlined Get Back the weekend it came out and it was really, really interesting. I'm not a diehard Beatles fan. I know people who are, but I'm just not. Some of it is that my parents weren't really huge Beatles fans. They were into different bands and also they just didn't listen to a lot of music. They just weren't in depth like creative people. So I wasn't surrounded by it all the time. One of the things that I like to remember is that the Beatles were only around for 10 years. They were an incredibly yeah. short-lived band. And this is kind of a midpoint. My brain was having the hardest time wrapping around the fact that this is in 64 and by 70 when they're trying to put on this concert and finish the album that they're working on, they're entirely different people. They have discovered drugs. They have discovered women. They have discovered carousing and they have discovered paying for things with their own money and having lots and lots and lots of money for themselves. And it's just wild because again, I'm almost 40. Time has a different meaning for me now. So to see these guys go from dade, darched shirt, boys, to what they were in Get Back, which is like long hair stoned out of their minds musicians. Ringo, every time he looked at the camera, my friend, I could smell it on you. <laughs> and how they got from there to there, it's a mind boggling experience. It's fascinating as both a story because it is very concise. It's very well written. It is very entertaining. You are in it for the whole ride of Hard Day's Night. And then the story of their careers. It's such an interesting movie. This movie starts with them famously, and it's a scene that's been done in every other movie of them being chased by their fans. The last 15 minutes of this film is just concert footage of them performing in the big show that they've been leading up to. But watching the reaction of real fans, that's something that can't really be quantified today, even though we've seen it 
I watched a documentary a couple years ago about one of the photographers that photographed the Beatles during their final show at Candlestick Park to watch the footage of grown women and teenage girls, a lot of teenage girls, just go into these paroxysms of glee and eventually pass out or freak out. It's on the level of watching women experience Elvis for the first time. But yet there's such a remove because Elvis, yes, is putting out sexuality. You get the gyrating and the hips. You understand why women are losing their minds. The Beatles didn't have that. They just existed. They just perform their songs. They stand in one place. They don't dance. There's nothing going on. And yet in this movie, you see it as well. Just women tearing their hair, ripping their shirts. They are losing their minds. And it's something that to a modern audience feels very weird. I don't think we have any equivalent for that today. Oh, I was watching the movie with my husband and he looked at me and he was like, is this fake? Was it seated amongst the girls? He was like, did they have actresses in the stands to start the wave of screaming, crying, throwing up? Ringers. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Did they have ringers? Why you were talking about girls fainting and things like that. I was like, it's because they were all in girdles and we don't wear those anymore. Or are they fainting because they just can't breathe because their undergarments are too tight? Maybe that's the main difference between the Beatles years and my youth of in sync years. Whereas like girls would still lose their minds, but they weren't sobbing. Maybe the equivalent is like K-pop. Maybe. Maybe. And I'm not in the K-pop scene enough to really make an accurate determination, but that could very well be it. I want to talk about some of the individual moments in this movie that I think work to good effect. The John Lennon scenes are probably the showiest. He spends a lot of time being a wise ass. But there is a part that probably my favorite scene that I love watching it every time it's on. But it's the scene where they're in the bathroom. George is shaving. The manager or whatever wants to know how to shave because apparently he's never done it before. And so he's teaching him to shave on the bathroom mirror. But John Lennon is in the bathtub In like a little captain's hat or a little conductor's cap, he's essentially reenacting like World War II with the bubbles. And it all culminates with him going under the water, George Harrison telling the manager, oh, Lennon's in the bathtub. And the guy's like, okay, Lennon, you got to get out of the tub. And he pulls the plug and the water disappears and John is missing. He's not in the tub and he finally comes back and he's all dressed and ready to go. And he's like, we got to move. We talked about absurdity in something like Spice World with aliens showing up. I cannot stress that enough. I don't know why aliens show up in Spice World. Here, you get just enough absurdity to make it plausible. Why does he disappear from the bathtub? Was he ever really there? Is the audience watching this in 1964? Should they be stoned in some way? I don't know. But it just works. It works. It does work. John is definitely characterized as the smartest one of all of them in this. He makes the most advanced jokes. He almost acts like Peter Sellers in a lot of ways. The accent work, he does a lot of weird little accents, and it's really bizarre. I would love to know if Sellers influenced him or vice versa. He makes one really good drug joke that I never noticed before. The manager is handing out lunch. And he hands John a bottle of Coke, Coca-Cola, and John immediately sticks it up his nose and pretends to snort it. And I was like, oh, I didn't notice that when I was 18. That's a very not 1964 joke. I wonder how that one made it past. Teenage girls, don't ask questions. Have you joined Ticklish Business Patreon yet? You should, just like Allie Moore, Amy Hart, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Gates, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Krista Painter, McGeff, and Rachel Clark. Listen to episodes 48 hours early watch exclusive video interviews, receive merch, and even guests on an episode. You also get access to bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Double Features, and our latest series, But Have You Read the Series? It all starts at just $1 at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. Yeah, okay. I guess they didn't have the same level of censorship in Britain as they did here. Okie (laughs) dokie. No, he's definitely presented as the brains of the group, which is odd considering... We all know the historic push-pull between Lennon and McCartney. This movie 
tries to equalize everybody as best as they can, but it's Lennon and McCartney still. They have the most fleshed out personas and the most, I would say, invigorating stories. Although Ringo does get that whole second act where he decides to go off and see the world, or at least the big parading. the big parading scene where he's going to see the countryside and little kids are giving him guff and whatnot. You don't see how these two titans of music would agree or disagree with each other. They just exist as separate entities, not necessarily as partners. And yet, John is presented as the cut-up, and McCartney is presented as just the logical one. He's the one that understands the type of person that his grandfather is. He's the one that has the media training. He's the sensible guy. I don't know how I feel about that dynamic. Which I have to admit, after watching Get Back, I feel like was probably fairly accurate to the actual representation of their people. Because again, if you haven't sat down and watched this documentary series that's on Disney+, Plus, they're like, we have an album we have to deliver. And Paul's like, I'm just going to sit down and write seven songs until we're done. And he just writes seven songs until they're done because Paul's a professional. This is my bias. Paul is probably my second favorite Beatle. I like the fact that they divvy up the songs. There's three performances. You get a John song, you get a Paul song, you get a George song, which I wasn't really expecting. Good for them. They try to keep it very equal. But the maturity of being an adult watching this goes, Paul must have had headaches up the wazoo all the time dealing with these people. You know, the other two subplots that we get, the parading scene with Ringo is great. He also gets that subplot in the beginning where he gets invited to the Kai Rollers Club that is clearly a callback to Bond. Le Cirque is an Ian Fleming thing, but the granddad goes as Ringo Starr and he starts gambling away all their money. But the parading scene, too, is also really good. You know, Ringo is often considered the forgotten Beatle, right? And yet this movie really does situate him as this guy with hidden depths, he appreciates the world. He's just one with the people. He's salt of the earth. That has its charm. The parading scene, it's beautifully filmed. It's very much, you can see where Richard Lester was coming from, that kitchen sink dramas of Britain that were very popular, like Taste of Honey and Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. He's definitely almost presenting Ringo Starr as one of the angry young men of this genre of film without the anger element of it and it works it's weird because if you actually look at like the concept of it as being like character development if you want to apply that to this movie in any way Ringo actually gets character development while the other guys are just the guys one of the first gags in it is that their manager brings stacks of fan mail into the room there's a big stack for Paul, there's a big stack for George, there's a big stack for John. And then he hands one thing to Ringo and they're like, oh, sorry, mate, that's the only one you got. And then he gets the biggest stack of all, you know, out of all of them. And the other guys are just kind of flabbergasted. The speech that Paul's grandfather gives him is just, they don't respect you. They treat you like you're the butt of the joke. And Ringo's just kind of like, yeah, but I don't really mind because my favorite thing about Ringo is that Ringo is just happy to be there. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened. I'm happy to be here. I don't really care about anything else. I'm super chuffed to be here. The grandfather just basically says, you don't have to just be happy to be here. You have to earn their respect to go out and see the world. And then you get the little interstitial where he does. And it's very charming. It's very just delicate and charming. There's little moments where Ringo Starr, and again, I'm just fluffing up my favorite Beatle, but it's fine because I love him. He has really good comedic timing. The little bits where they're jumping in the air and they're floating and then they go to Ringo and he just does a little hop. That's adorable. That's wonderful comedic timing. Or when the camera falls into the river and he's just like, okay, he's probably the best actor out of all of them. He got more plot than the rest of them. You can see why Ringo would go on to do more acting. He would work in Kent Russell films and he would have a cameo in Pop Star, which is the second best fake pop movie ever made. He definitely showed his chops. He might not have rhythm, as the dancing sequence in this movie tells us, but... He's the drummer of the band. He's not supposed to have rhythm. But I like his plot line far more than George Harrison gets a plot in this movie where he gets 
brought into a company that is looking for at teen fashions and wants to get his opinions. And he's just like, all your clothes are horrible. I hate them. That's great and all. But I feel like it's one of those moments where the movie wants to put in this dichotomy between like, oh, the adults today and the youths. Again, the Beatles were not youths when they made this movie at all. So it it doesn't work as well. I like that nod to the fact that George was the most stylish Beatle. That man loved clothes more than anybody else. Definitely, definitely. Which is ironic, too, because they pretty much wear the same outfits for the majority of the film. They're in the tuxes. There's also, again, to just go back to John Lennon and the weirdness that we give him. There's that whole extended scene with him and the woman that she's like, you look just like, and he's like, no, no, I'm not. And they have that banter back and forth where they're talking about how like horrible the guy that she thinks he is might be. It's him. It's really bad improv because it doesn't actually like (laughs) culminate in anything. It just ends in her going, I have to go, which is how every bad improv scene ends. Round of applause for trying. He held his own for a little while. You can feel the movie start to run out of steam pretty quickly. The last 15 minutes, again, is just them performing. And you get a little bit of Paul's granddad trying to sell their autograph. He goes to the police station. The Beatles have to go save him and Ringo and this kind of Keystone Cops foot chase. They get back to the show, all's well that ends well. And then the movie just ends. I mean, the film is a very, very scant 90 minutes. It wastes not a lick of time. And while I tend to zone out a little bit over those last 15 minutes, The first half of it is so frenetic and compelling that you're willing to be lulled at that point. Yeah, it is very relaxing, especially because they're not, while obviously Hard Day's Night is a very catchy song and very, very famous, not every song in this is a Beatles banger. Every single song is not just like, oh, I know that song. There were a couple as a not huge Beatles fan. I didn't really know. And they have two of them at the end. And then it just goes to credits. Hard Day's Night gets played a lot, which Ringo came up with the title. That was a phrase he used. Can't Buy Me Love is probably the most prominent song that's utilized, but they are just rehashing songs by the end of this. They did eventually cut, I think, like two or three songs that they were going to include. They didn't for the time that they had. They've done some type of restoration to this, but people, I think, weren't really fans of the restored version, so... The cut songs haven't all come back. To think, though, the Beatles would do two other movies after this. They would do Help and Yellow Submarine, neither one of which I can tell you just off of personal experience. I have not seen Help or Yellow Submarine. I do wonder if the bloom was off the rose after this movie of them as actors. I've not seen either of them. I've seen bits of Yellow Submarine. I haven't seen any bits of Help. Yellow Submarine feels more like a concept album of my understanding of it. It's just like, oh, they did the thing and it's animated, so it's different. So it's just voiceover work. At that point, people just got really tired of the commodification of the Beatles. Ubiquity. Yeah, exactly. We had bobblehead dolls. We had posters. We had dolls. We had guitar picks. We had their faces on mugs, their faces on t-shirts, their faces on this, their faces on that. Okay, at a certain point, it's like you might just be trying to sell us something and you can have your funny little art projects. We'll see if we're a huge fan, but this is not the same, like you said, level of shine. They filmed Help the year after. It was a really, really tight turnaround. Most people knew that the Beatles could flame out just as quickly as they started. They filmed Help pretty much right after the commercial success for A Hard Day's Night. And the Beatles were not happy with it. They hated making it. They hated how it turned out. And a lot of that was because the movie got a larger budget. It was filmed in color. It had location filming. It had a far bigger soundtrack than this film does. But at the same time, the Beatles had a lot of input in A Hard Day's Night. And when you're making more money to make your movie, you don't have that input. John Lennon said that he felt like he was an extra in the movie because Richard Lester got all of the decisions made. They weren't really utilized in that same way. That might be part of why just most people don't watch it. I don't think the Beatles are good enough actors for us not to know if they're not having fun with making a film. I do also know that the year that this came out... 
music was so fundamentally changed by the fact that the Rolling Stones were now on the scene. And so the Beatles had to change their sound, adapt, and grow up, to use a horrible phrase that's probably going to get me hell from Beatles fans. But it had to become a different thing really, really quickly. That more worldly, political way of approaching music was more in line with what they all wanted to do. But it also doesn't lend itself to goofy boys running through a train station, movies and packaging. By the time they did Yellow Submarine, that was in 68, filmmaking was so different. And I know that Yellow Submarine is an animated film. It's a movie you can get high to. But at the same time, the Beatles were not excited to make Yellow Submarine either. They were so demoralized for making Hell, but they needed to make a third film to fulfill their contract to UA. And that's essentially what this was, was a way for them to get out of the contract that they had. Where the boys discover LSD. (laughs) Richard Lester is a really interesting entity in this whole thing. Her Day's Night was really one of his big commercial successes, and then he would follow it up with The Knack and How to Get It. Then he did help. He worked with the Beatles twice, and then he made this anti-war movie. And he would go on to make some big... 1960s films, most famously Petulia in 1968 with Julie Christie in the bed sitting room. He really was the big name of British cinema. I I don't think we can ignore his contributions there. He got hired by Alexander and Ilya Salkind. They were not exploitation filmmakers, but they were more low budget. He would go on to do a version of The Three Musketeers in 1973, the famous one with Oliver Reed and Faye Dunaway that ended up getting everybody in trouble because the producers decided to split it into two movies and people got sued because they didn't tell the actors they were making two different films. So they only got paid to make one film. Oh, yeah, it was a huge, huge, massive lawsuit at the time. That's awful. Richard Lester kept making movies. He did Superman 2. He directed Superman 3, which is not necessarily well remembered. He definitely is a part of what makes the movie work so well. He really understood British cinema. He really understood British people, characters. That's part of why the movie endures as well as it does. And probably a boon for the fact that one of the most relatable characters in this entire movie is the television director who's just trying to get everybody to show up on time. (laughs) That final concert sequence, I always laugh about it because the Beatles are such a huge band. Such a huge band. And that's such a tiny little concert. It's just them on this bare stage. I kept thinking of if people go back and listen to our Valley of the Dolls episode, that moment when Susan Hayward is performing the Broadway show and she's just got one prop on the stage and you're just like, what is the audience thinking when they're watching this woman dance with one lone tree? It's the same thing. You're watching the Beatles and it's just them squished together. You can almost feel their elbows rubbing against each other. The sense of scope is not there. That was a really interesting time capsule element for this movie for me, that they're supposed to be performing on a variety show. Very Ed Sullivan aspect of it. All the acts that are around them are so fuddy-duddy and boring and weird. And then you have literally the sexiest men alive, the most wanted and desired four men in the universe performing amongst that. It was very indicative of me of what growing up in the 60s must have been like. I'm going to tell a really quick story. My mom is old enough to be of the Beatles' age. She was babysitting one night at a client's house. She was a teenager. She turned on the television and there was an advertisement for a very well-known brand of beverage called Hawaiian Punch. We all know the ad campaign if you're older than a certain age. The little character goes, how about a nice Hawaiian Punch? And he punches someone in the face. My mother was so horrified she turned off the television, hid the remote, and didn't turn it on for the next day because that's what television was like in the 1960s. The most mundane, nonviolent thing you and I can imagine was so horrifying to her that she turned off the television. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So of course the Beatles were performing amongst guys doing ballroom dancing and people singing opera on boring evening television. Of course they were. Of course, that's how they took everybody by storm. To look at some of the other rock musicals that would come along after this, think of, you can go listen to our episode we did on Tommy or my personal favorite, Listomania. 
you often didn't get musicians playing themselves. They often were more often the traditional route was just put them as characters in fictional films. That didn't always work. You know, not everybody could be Elvis Presley, even though Elvis Presley was often really stymied by the films that he was making. We don't get these day in the life movies anymore. And even when they would try to do them in the 70s and 80s, I mean, most famously like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, not a great success. And then you have Spice World. We just bring it back around to Spice World, which by the time Spice World came out, the Spice Girls had pretty much flamed out by that point. They'd already lost a member of the band. So when we talk about movies that could be remade today, I don't see A Hard Day's Night being remade in the same sense and having the same success of taking untrained performers and making you care about them as characters without getting angry that they are not the people that they're playing, if that makes any sense. I definitely think it makes sense. And I also think that there's something that is missing. I opine the death of the rock bands. Rock bands don't really exist in the way that they used to. And then the other thing is, is that I don't know if musicians are supposed to be fun anymore. Obviously, we have the wild success of Taylor Swift and the wild success of Beyonce and their concert movies that came out. But that's a concert movie. That's a documentary. That's a filming of a performance with probably some, I don't know, I haven't seen them, probably some backstage stuff interspersed. I don't know if we're supposed to expect that wildly successful people on the road are having a good time anymore. Like I was talking earlier about all the behind the scenes tour documentaries of my emo rock band youth. They had to talk about how serious the art was and how what meant something to them and how it came from their torture and their emotions. And I want fun movies like Spice World and Hard Day's Night and people going like, isn't this great? We lucked into something that is totally awesome and let's have fun with it. What does George Harrison say at the interview thing where they're like, has success changed you? And he's like, yes, that's funny because it's just brutally honest. Yeah. There's a reason Taylor Swift is not making a movie about being Taylor Swift. There's talk about her making narrative film where she's directing. We've seen her act in certain things. You know, she's not really adept at playing a character, but she's a musician. She's not an actress. It's interesting that we probably won't see something like A Hard Day's Night. And even when Spice World came out, that was very much billed as A Hard Day's Night. To watch A Hard Day's Night, it's not. That's the thing. I'm like, it's a hard day's night for people that have never seen the movie. Because a hard day's night is still very much grounded in reality. It's absurdist at times. But it never makes you feel like you are watching some sort of just kooky, crazy movie that is not bound by reality. I will say really quickly, though, that I think one of the boons that the Spice Girls had in relating them to the Beatles was the fact that we weren't supposed to know their real names. Obviously, we did. But they were Sporty Spice, Scary Spice, Baby Spice. They were characters. You knew that Posh Spice wasn't that behind scenes. She wore jeans and flats. It's a huge distinction. And I talked about this earlier when I said we didn't know the Beatles' personal lives in this movie. This movie starts and ends with them at this specific moment in time. Not 10 minutes from now, not two years before, now, right the second. What people find funny about Spice World and how dated it is, is the internet has taught us there's a whole backstory. And I say this as somebody that has watched Spice World really recently because I think it's fun. But there's a whole backstory where they flash back to their origin of them being scrappy young girls. We're best friends from childhood and they meet up at the pub and their fake friend that is pregnant throughout the movie has been there the whole time for them. They wrote this song that's their big hit and they perform it. They're like, oh, Pop Wigglesby or whatever, who's the pub owner. They're like, we're always going to be best friends and come to this pub and we're just girls. As a teenage girl who knew nothing and didn't have the Internet, I bought that story hook, line, and sinker. You find out when you get the Internet, you can Google that they were created in a lab, that they were created by the guy who did American Idol picked out of thousands of girls. They did not know each other. That's why A Hard Day's Night is so timeless. You may know all this stuff about the Beatles, but the movie's pretty much saying, we never told you this was a true story. This is just about the Beatles today at 
3 p.m. It's not about them before or after. We never presented you their origin story. We never said they were best friends. We're not giving you anything more than what you are seeing right this second. And that, weirdly enough, is what makes the movie work because you don't have the ability to really debunk anything. No, that's a perfect summary. It's authenticity without any authenticity. Also, just go watch Spice World. They're worth shotgunning back to back. They're a lot of fun. A Hard Day's Night, it's one of the great rock movies. It's up there with Listomania for me is my favorite. I definitely think a full-length film of Ringo parading is worth it. And John Lennon writing tits on a notepad. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. You can see exactly that that's what he wrote. Emily, final thoughts on A Hard Day's Night? It's not going to be a once a month watch for me, but it is very delightful. I have a lot of questions about the musicianship always of watching them play. And thankfully, I got a good source sitting next to me on the couch so I can ask all these things. And without getting, let's be here, a lot of very didactic Beatles fans explaining everything and the intricacies to me. It's like, I don't need to know it. It's definitely a pop culture thing that you can consume and not feel bad if you don't know all the ins and outs and what have yous of the Beatles. And like you said, because it takes place in one hard day's night, it's done. In, out, fantastic little story. And they're all very charming. Let us know your thoughts on A Hard Day's Night. Who your favorite Beatle is, Ringo, I don't know. You can email it to us at ticklishbase at gmail.com or you can send it to us via all social media platforms. That's going to close us out for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We would love a review in 2024. So leave us one on Apple Podcasts of five stars. We are on all social media, as I mentioned, Twitter slash X at ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ticklish biz. You can follow me on all social media at Kristen Lopez 88, as well as at my official website, which is kristinklopez.com. Emily Edwards, where are you online? I am still Instagram and Blue Sky mostly. I finally deleted my Twitter. I feel so free. If you are looking on any social media platforms, I'm probably there at Ms. Emily Edwards and also at Ms. Emily Edwards.com. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like that amazing Dave Carker interview, as well as the bonus episodes we were promised we were going to get back into, as well as trying to inch ever closer to our 50th patron so we can give away this prize pack. I'm going to put a picture of it up online. I'm pretty impressed with it. Consider helping us at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And remember, you can listen to every episode of this podcast going all the way back to episode one. I don't know if you really want to because it was really rough back then, but you can find our archive always at ticklish business dot podbean.com we are authors please buy our books they help us to write new books which is what we are currently doing in our free time our next episode will be on april 24th it's going to be our regular staple our tcm classic film festival audio and if you're at the festival please be on the lookout for me i will have stickers buttons cards all sorts of things till then 